Sean Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us for Newsmaker Saturday. We're going to talk about the implications for humanity with the rise of artificial intelligence, AI, later in the program. But we begin with a more immediate concern, the fire season in Arizona. And so far, it's been pretty quiet this year. With an incredibly wet winter that followed a very good wet monsoon, but we're about to enter a critical period next week with soaring temperatures 110 plus in the Phoenix area. Fire mitigation specialist with the Bureau of Land Management, Wade Reeves, joins me now. Good to see you, Wade. Thank you for joining us. Uh, really good wet winter, and the old axiom used to be that if you got a wet, you know, snowy winter, great to suppress fire in the highlands, in the, in the high country, Ponderosa, Pine, Stands, and all of that. But with all the growth of stuff in the desert, you'd get urban fires. We haven't even really gotten that yet. Yeah, yeah, and thanks for having me. But uh, we've been fortunate to this point this year. Uh, like you said, we had a very wet winter. Um, that setup kind of continued through spring. We were cool and damp through most of the spring. And I think that has kind of led to uh, a delay in fire activity this year, but certainly uh, with the moisture we received this winter, um, the fuels are out there in the deserts and they're cured and ready to burn at this point. I would agree with you. I think uh, we're very close to a turning point and we've already seen increased activity the last week or two uh, around the state. And I think that's just gonna continue in the coming weeks. Now B you're with BLM. So BLM, as I understand it, you guys manage about 12 million acres around the, uh, around the state of public lands. That's correct, uh, uh, just over 12 million. What percentage of the state is that? I, I don't even know how to calculate that. In other <laughs> words, how much does BLM handle versus Forest Service? Yeah, and, and you know, I, don't, I couldn't tell you exactly myself, but it, it is a large, a large portion of Arizona. Um, we cover a lot of the public lands that you see in the lower areas. Obviously, the Forest Service uh, covers a lot of the higher elevation uh, forested lands, and we cover a lot of the desert landscape. Okay, so you are probably more worried in your field of expertise. You're worried about these kind of urban interface fires, right? Talking about like Cave Creek or Fountain Hills. These kinds of Absolutely. places have had their fires, right? Absolutely. Uh, our urban interface areas are always a priority. Uh, they're always, always a concern uh, with fire activity, especially on a year like this where we do have uh, grass fuel loading in those areas. Wade, have we gotten the message out effectively enough for people to build and manage defensible space around their properties or their businesses? Yeah, you know, it's an ongoing effort um, and it's a challenge with my position specifically, um, trying to find ways to reach more people. Um, this is obviously helpful, um, but we do have um, you know, a, a rapid increase in population in Arizona. Our, our population has basically doubled since 1990. And that means we have a lot of people moving into Arizona that aren't familiar with the state. Um, they maybe don't understand um, the, the role that wildfires play here. And um, it's our challenge to, to find avenues to get that information out to everybody so they can be prepared. Where is BLM on f fire management in terms of kind of the overarching philosophy? Have we have we gotten too aggressive in certain areas with fire suppression, not letting fire do its normal thing, or is it complicated because now so many people are moving right on the right on the edge or in forests or in or in burn areas? Yeah, it's it's certainly complicated. Um, I think historically that was an issue um, for a lot of years uh, going back, you know, decades. Um, it was basically a full suppression strategy. Anytime you got a wildfire, you stomped it as quickly as you could and uh, got it over with. And over the last, you know, 30 to 30 years for sure, um, I think we've changed our stance a little bit. All the agencies have recognizing that we need to do something a little bit differently. Um, and that's where you've seen a lot more uh, fuels management activities trying to reduce hazard fuel accumulations. And some of those accumulations were due to a lack of wildfire for a long time. So we've been trying to work on reducing those accumulations of hazard fuels. Um, and every ecosystem is a little bit different. Um, the desert you have to treat differently than you do um, some of the forested areas. Most of our deserts are not fire adapted. So fire is very destructive on those ecosystems and it 
at times can limit our options on how we address fuel loading issues in those areas. Yeah, you you really are kind of limited on doing controlled burns anyway when you're when you're right up against a foothills uh, area like like a Cave Creek or I, I mentioned Fountain Hills. I mean, there's so many places North Phoenix where I don't even know how you manage that. Yeah, it's it's certainly a challenge. Um, obviously, there's more options in our forested areas where that is a fire adapted ecosystem, and and uh, we have more options. You move into the desert areas, um, doing any burning in those areas is fairly destructive to those native species uh, that are on the ground. So we have to take more of a mechanical approach, um, and we we do fuel breaks a lot around a lot of those communities. Um, but fire is typically excluded unless we're just doing some pile burning uh, of, of some brush and things like that that have been cut around those communities. Wait, is there a fire season anymore in Arizona or is this a year round thing? Yeah, um, you know, there's there's some new, terminolo ter new terminology being floated around. Uh, we've always called it a fire season. In recent years, people are saying, why don't we just call it a fire year because um, we definitely get wildfire activity uh, every month of the year. Arizona is especially prone to that because we have a warm, dry climate. So uh, especially in portions of southern Arizona, uh, we can have large wildfires any month of the year. Okay, so generally it has been in Arizona, it's late April, May, June. Those are the big, those are the big months for fires generally. And late June is really, this is the area we're getting into now with these big temperature spikes we're gonna see next week. Are you worried about what next week might bring? Um, I, I wouldn't say worried. I think we're, we're as prepared as we can be. Um, you know, we have a lot of experienced firefighters around the state. Uh, this is what they prepare for. Um, you're absolutely right though. We're moving into peak fire season right now. Our fire danger generally peaks late June, early July before the onset of monsoon moisture. This year, it looks like that moisture may be a little bit delayed getting to Arizona, so we're fully expecting the next several weeks to be busy. Um, and then obviously that first week or two when the monsoon activity picks up, uh, we typically typically get some dry thunderstorms, um, and that's always a concern as well. But uh, I think we're prepared and, uh, and ready to see what comes. Yeah, that's kind of the critical period because you wait for the monsoon, but in the early phases of the monsoon, you get lightning and the lightning strikes can cause fires. And this year's, you, nice segue by the way, this year's monsoon forecasted to be drier than normal with above normal temperatures. Yeah, yeah, so I, you know, I think that string of luck we've had so far this year with wet and cool conditions may be coming to an end if the forecasts are correct. Um, I'm hoping we get surprised and, and, and get some good rains like we've seen the last couple of monsoon seasons, but we're fully prepared for uh, a pretty extent, extended uh, dry and hot period through this summer. Did the cooling or, or the cooler temperatures that we've had this spring, late spring, did that help on, on retaining moisture um, in the ground that, that, and, and in the vegetation that keeps it from sparking? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, our lower desert areas typically dry out first after, after the winter. Um, but even, you know, this year we saw, I, I would say, a, almost a three or four week delay in the curing of our, of our vegetation. So some of those areas that might have been completely cured out and, uh, you know, ready for wildfire activity um, by the end of April, it, it was close to the end of May before they were cured out to that point this year. And as you move up in elevation to our forested areas, um, they're still kind of enjoying that, uh, that lengthy wet period that we had this spring. So fire danger has definitely been a little slower to uh, come up this year. Another point on suppression, I've been noticing in the past few years, I'm seeing the aerial tankers get out and jump on these fires. We saw it along I-17 a few weeks ago. Uh, something broke out there, probably man-caused, and they jumped it early with a tanker. So it seemed that that stuff would be brought in later in the old days. Now it's like we're going to get on it and knock it down and leave nothing to chance. Am I, am I reading that wrong? Yeah, you know, the advantage we have right now um, with the lack of fire activity around the southwestern United States, we have a lot of available resources. So a lot of those tankers are sitting, uh, waiting on that fire call. So 
some years where we might have to prioritize where those tankers are going and there might be a delayed response to a particular wildfire. Um, recently, we've we've had the availability to put those immediately on a fire and, and get them there quickly. So that's a nice, uh, uh, nice opportunity to have. And, and like we just talked about, that may be changing as we get busier. That's interesting. So it may just be assets versus a strategy change. Yeah, yeah. And okay. you know, every fire, um, is managed a little bit differently, but any fire that we deem as a full suppression uh, response, if, if the order goes in for that air tanker, that they're obviously going to get there as quickly as they can. And um, it is nice to have one close by that that uh, can get there quickly. You know, it seems that we're still the biggest threat out there are humans. Humans are causing the lion's share of fires. I think it's well over 50 percent. Lightning's somewhere around 21 percent, and the rest is kind of unknown. Um, it could be either. Any any word on that as we close here? Yeah, you know, nationally, I, I think um, the, the figures that are thrown out there most years are, are roughly 85% of all wildfires are human caused. Wow. Um, and I don't think Arizona is too far off. I know it varies from year to year, but um, absolutely, uh, you know, that human environment, uh, there, there's a lot of ways that a wildfire can be started. And, and uh, obviously that's part of our message um, to try to get out there to folks uh, how to how to reduce some of those causes and, and uh, try to prevent some of those fires that are easily preventable. Fire mitigation specialist with Bureau of Land Management, Wade Reeves, kind enough to join me today. Good to see you, Wade. Thank you and good luck. I know this next week could could be challenging. All right. Thank you. You got it. Thank you. Coming up next, artificial intelligence, AI. We've been hearing a lot about it, much of it frightening. Should we fear it or welcome it? We're going to talk with an expert on the subject next on Newsmaker Saturday. Welcome back to Newsmaker Saturday. Artificial intelligence, AI, once the stuff of science fiction, is coming at us like a freight train. In fact, to a large degree, it's already here. Are we ready for it? Is it good for society? Or is it an evil that threatens to destroy us? It's heady stuff. Jeff Hughes is an expert, an AI expert, a teacher, and an author of How to Raise Smart Kids with AI. He's also a founder and CEO of a Skill Samurai, which is a coding in STEM academy that prepares kids and teens for careers in STEM, including AI, artificial intelligence. Jeff, thanks for being with us. My pleasure, thanks for having me. I wanna start with a quote from Stephen Hawking, the noted physicist. Um, he says, efforts to create thinking machines pose a threat to our very existence. It could be the worst event in the history of our civilization. He told the BBC, development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Thoughts? Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's hopefully the worst case scenario. Um, and when we look at this, I think we want to avoid looking at these future sci-fi apocalyptic scenarios and maybe um, place ourselves in looking at what are some of the real current dangers. I think there's enough of those uh, in the short term for us to be concerned about. Uh, and there are also a lot of potential benefits and life-changing opportunities uh, that will come about because of AI. Jeff, we, we, you know, we really started noticing this, just the lay person, and I would include mm -hmm. myself in this. When we started talking about chat GPT, doing kids term papers, but AI has mm -hmm. been around since the 1950s. Everybody's been trying to figure out how to, and I don't even know if supercomputer is the right word <laughs> for it, but a almost thinking machine. Yeah, and it has, it goes all the way back even further than that when you look at um, science fiction literature from the early 1900s, books like The Wizard of Oz having these thinking machines and then all the robots that we've seen through the 50s and 60s. Uh, but yeah, in the last, you know, six months, seven months, with the rise of ChatGPT, it's really come to the forefront. And what ChatGPT has done is made it accessible for people like you and me to be able to have access to a whole world of information just by asking the right questions. Since you're a teacher, I'm sure you've got an opinion on this. What about kids using this to write a term paper? Can you discern if something is chat GPT versus the student's brain? 
Yeah, I have had heated discussions with my teacher friends about this. And what happened, you know, probably back in, in my day, if I cheated and copied something out of an encyclopedia, the teacher would know. In the same way now, if you have a student who is getting C's and B's, suddenly able to uh, summarize Macbeth in one paragraph, something's going to be up. So <laughs> teachers are able to catch it right now. Yeah. Um, but I think the smart students will even be able to get past some of that um, software that can catch it. So what are you telling the kids now about their future in the world and their opportunities for work when it seems that every discipline could be assailed by, by mm -hmm. AI? Yeah, I think first and foremost for all of us, uh, it's about education. So learning about the capabilities and limitations of AI and even having our kids begin to learn what it means to be a prompt engineer um, in before AI came out, we were telling parents that by 2030, 85% of jobs that people will have then don't exist yet. So kids wow. in middle school right now are going to school for jobs and they don't even know what they are. So the best thing students can do is learn about it, understand it so that they'll be ready, hopefully for whatever comes their way. Okay, so listening to me on this uh, discussion we're having, I sound like a geezer, I'm fully aware of it, <laughs> who's a little bit suspicious of this whole thing. Give me the positive case for this technology, yeah. for AI. Sure, you know, and you're not a geezer. My daughters are 15 and 17, and they hate everything about AI. They wow. want to be teachers, um, and when I talk about it, they are just disgusted with the whole idea. But um best case scenarios are really high ai can be used in medicine as all of our data goes online ai will be able to learn from that uh, it'll be able to diagnose diseases quicker it will be able to make customized medicine just for you rather than for uh, the whole world uh, hopefully ai will uh, be able to fix or help with a lot of redundant tasks that you don't like doing we already have, you know, robotic vacuums and lawnmowers. Imagine all of those routine tasks in your life being done by, by AI and robots so that you are free to hopefully pursue things that you are passionate about. Uh, maybe things that are more creative or uh, things that you, you can't do because you are stuck uh, making a meal plan for the week. Uh, so Vinch, there are- Yeah, uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh yeah, no, just, it, it's really going to, make a lot of people's lives easier. Um, the other day I was driving from Tampa Bay to Nashville and I just put in to chat GPT, create a route for me and that will have me stop at the highest rated barbecue restaurants. <laughs> and it spit that out for me. So you can find ways to use it to really uh, enhance your life presently. Well, I love that example. I'm on board with that. If that if that's the future, I love it. I love the future. All right. Eventually, these programs, correct me if I'm wrong, will basically have ingested every bit of human made digital material. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we manage moving forward to where these become potentially dangerous and smarter than us and a runaway right. train? Yeah, that is. Um it's really, really important that we are aware of those possibilities. I know now they're, they're trying to put through legislation in Congress that will kind of keep rails on to what AI can do and how we can use it. Uh, Jeff, GPT, let, me, let me stop example. you there for a second because we've got a, sure. we've got a sound bite with a minority leader in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, um, or is he majority? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is, he is the head of the Senate. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm trying to keep up with all this. Uh, let's listen to Schumer talking about this exact thing. Take a listen. We can say with confidence that the age of AI is here and it is here to stay. And we're still just at the beginning. Some experts predict in just a few years the world could be wholly rec unrecognizable from the one we live in today. That's what AI is, world altering.
Change at such blistering speed may seem frightening to some, but if applied correctly, AI promises to transform life on Earth for the better. It will shape how we fight disease, how we tackle hunger, manage our lives, enrich our minds, and ensure peace. But there are real dangers, too. Job displacement, misinformation, a new age of weaponry, the risk of being unable to manage this technology altogether. We have no choice, no choice, but to acknowledge that AI's changes are coming and in many cases are already here. We ignore them at our own peril. Many want to ignore AI because it's so complex. But with AI, we cannot be ostriches sticking our heads in the sand. The question is, what role does Congress and the federal government have in this new revolution? Are we capable of playing a proactive role in promoting AI's growth? Can Congress work to maximize AI's benefits while protecting the American people and all of humanity from its novel risks? I think the answer to these questions is an emphatic yes. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, um, when the politicians start to get involved, do you welcome it or are you nervous? Yeah, this is something we were just talking about today that we do need to rewrite kind of the, the social agreement that we have. Because if we create a technology that takes everyone's jobs, what are we going to do? We need to have a way uh, for people to still get paid. Um, you know, that sounds like a, a socialist idea or dream, uh, but we do need to have ways that displaced workers are, are not compensated, but we do need to give them opportunities for meaningful work and meaningful life uh, besides just the current job that they are losing. Uh, and I don't know if we're ready as a society to kind of pick up the tab for those people. Yeah, no doubt. This is the, um, what you're referring to is something called the alignment problem, right? You've heard that term. How to get mm -hmm. computer pro, uh, programs to respond or restrain themselves in ways that have the same ethical sensibilities of the rest of mm -hmm. society. That is a, <laughs> that is a powder keg, right? For sure, yeah. And there is kind of inherent biases because um, even AI at the moment only can respond to the things that you teach it. So if you enter in a lot of data that has your own personal bias and prejudice, then you're going to get answers and machines and systems that carry out those biases. So it is really difficult to create a computer program that is free from our own bias and our own, um, you know, our own desires to take over or control yeah. things. Well, this this is where the, the question of, you know, the leaders in this area, Google would be number mm -hmm. one, right? They are really aggressive on this. I think uh, even Adobe is getting very involved. Microsoft, mm -hmm. all the big companies are involved. But as we've seen, there is, as, as some have called it, the um, censorship industrial complex, mm -hmm. you know, where, mm -hmm. where thought is being pushed out and excluded because of political reasons. Does that concern right. you? Yeah, it is really, it really begins to question the place and the role of government in free speech. Uh, how much is too much? Uh, and how can we, how can we have these systems that are free to help us uh, without limiting the things that they either have access to or the things that we allow them to say. Yeah. It's a really uh, tricky area. Jeff, we've got about 45 seconds. Quick word to parents out there when they're talking to their kids about this, this new brand yeah, new world. I, yeah, thanks. I would encourage you to really educate your child, begin to teach them how to use AI so that they can shape their future and really have responsibility for, for their careers. Yeah, they've got to embrace it, right? Because change is the Definitely. only constant in this world. Hmm. So embrace yeah, it, for right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's really the only way forward for all of us. Jeff Hughes, AI expert, teacher, author, and we'll put up the book again. Jeff, thank you very much. The book's called How to Raise Smart Kids with AI. We appreciate your time today. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay. My pleasure. Thank Good you very much. You. Jeff Hughes. We're back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday.